guy up here? If you're going to talk neighbors, I got to tell you, I'm a little too old for Mr. Rod Rogers. I came along, I was just way too cool at 10 years old to watch Mr. Rogers. How many of you watched Mr. Rogers? With your children or your grandchildren? So you know the song, right? Let's sing it together. I'm serious. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. A be oh, you know it. For neighbor, could you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood. A neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, you've stopped singing. <laughs> Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Very good. Give yourselves a hand. A parable about neighborliness. And what do we call this parable? We call it the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, you heard me read. Now, granted, it was 45 seconds ago you heard me read. But anywhere in the parable does it say the Good Samaritan? That should give you a little bit of an indication about, even years later, how much the difficulty between Samaritans and Jews were so strong and continued to be strong. It would be like for us to say a parable, the good Nazi, the good terrorist, or if you're from Baltimore, the good New York Yankees fan. <laughs> there are some things that just don't make sense, do they? Now, if you are part of the millennial generation or younger, if you speak Harry Potter, I can sum up for you, and some of you are like, I speak Harry Potter, I know what you're talking about. I can sum up the controversy by telling you the Jews considered the Samaritans to be mudbloods. But for the rest of us, we might have to look at where that controversy started. About 800 years before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdoms split into the northern and the southern kingdoms. And the Assyrian exile happened. And then the Babylonian exile happened. And most of the Jews were carried out of the land, but some remained behind in the area that was called Samaria and in the city called Samaria. And when the Jews came back, when Cyrus of Persia ended the Babylonian exile, don't worry, we're not going to get any more historical than that because you're already looking like Cyrus of Persia. What's she talking about? They wanted to come back into the land. The temple had been destroyed. The Samaritans offered to help. The Jews said, no, you stayed here. You've mixed our blood with the blood of these strange foreigners. We want nothing to do with you. Through the years, it got worse. Because they had mixed blood, they would not allow the priests to enter the temple. And so they went and built another temple on Mount Gerizim. That's where the Samaritans continued to worship. Then things got even uglier. The Samaritans defiled the Jewish temple. They spread the bones of their dead around to defile the temple. So by the time that Jesus came into the picture, the hatred between these two groups of people was so intense, we can't even imagine it. We could look at some of the situations in the world today. What happened in the Balkan region, the Serbians and the Croats and those controversies there. We could look at the Zionists and the extreme Hamas of the Arab world people who will not even acknowledge each other's presence. That was the situation between Jews and Samaritans at the time of Jesus. And he was well aware of this hatred, this loathing, to the point that they don't even speak each other's name or acknowledge each other on the road. Now, when you ask Jesus a question, you've got to be careful because he's going to answer you. And especially if you're asking him a question that you already know the answer to because you're trying to impress him. Now, the man who walks up to Jesus, a good Jew, a righteous Jew, he's a lawyer. Now, not lawyer like you're practicing law today. Lawyer as in you're an expert in the first five books of the Bible, which are called the Torah or the Pentateuch. You absolutely know them. You know them by heart. You could, you could sit down and recite those books. And so he's an expert in the law, so what better question to ask Jesus than a question of the law? 
Now he goes up to him very reverently. Teacher, he says, a term of respect. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if you want to ask anybody what to do to inherit eternal life, I'm going to tell you what, Jesus is a good one to ask. Just be careful about how you approach him. Because Jesus knows who this is, knows the, the reason behind the question, so he says to him, okay, you know, what does it say in the law? And then he has a chance to shine. Ah, it says, love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, well, you know the answer. Go ahead. But wanting to justify himself further, he asks the question, and who is my neighbor? Jesus tells him a story. There was a man going down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. I don't know if you've ever seen the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Sometimes we picture um, a, a road of our own sort of cultural understanding. But the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was steep and arid. There was no vegetation. There were rocks. There were rock slides. There were places where you had to stay very close to the wall so you didn't fall off, sort of like southern West Virginia, for some of you have driven there, but without the trees. It was a notorious place for bandits to hide. It was also the road between the temple and the home of the temple priests. Temple priests served for a period of time that was prescribed. And a temple priest would always be a Levite, but not all Levites were temple priests yet. So who is going down the road first, Jesus says, after this poor man is beaten and left half dead on the road? But a priest goes by. Pretending not to see, he walks on the other side. I'm telling you, the road was so narrow that he had to just sort of edge by him. And also a Levite walks by. Now, biblical scholars will tell you that maybe there was a good reason for that, because if a priest touched a body that was dead, he would be defiled, and he would have to go and go through a long, long period of purification. Not exactly the truth. There were exceptions to the rule, and to render help to someone who was dying or someone who had just been killed was an exception to the rule. And Jesus doesn't, doesn't give them any outs for this. And the Levite walks by, and then he says, and then a Samaritan walks by. The person who asked the question would have felt slapped in the face. That was how abhorrent the word is. I cannot even go there. The Samaritan comes by. The Samaritan stops and uses oil to soften his wounds, wine to disinfect his wounds, two very costly commodities. And if you are in an arid climate and you are traveling, two things that you need to hold on to for your own need, but he willingly shares. He puts the man on his animal, meaning that he himself is now vulnerable to attack from the bandits that might be around the next curve in the road. And he takes him to an inn, and he takes out an incredible amount of money and gives it to the innkeeper, and he says, if I owe you more on the way back, I'll pay more. How many of you do you think would pick up a hitchhiker on the side of the road who looked down on his luck, take him to the Holiday Inn Express, and leave your credit card for him to use if he needed it? Probably not. Jesus turns to the man who asked the question and asks him a question. He says, which one was a neighbor? He can't even say the Samaritan. He says, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. It's a simple story. We like to tell it in Bible school. I remember, I remember being in a skit in Bible school a thousand and two years ago, John and Charles Wesley were in my class. <laughs> and we acted out this story at Bible school, and everybody fought over three parts. Guess who they fought over? They wanted to be. First of all, they wanted to be the guy who got beat up. I wasn't sure about that. And then the next two parts were the guys who beat him up. That's what everybody wanted to be. Nobody wanted to be the Samaritan. But we have to look at the story and we have to find God in the story. We have to find Jesus in the story. We have to find ourselves in the story if it's really going to have any impact on us today. And I don't think we read this Bible just so we can say, we read the Bible today in church. If there is not the part of it that says, what does this do to inform my faith in 2019 in Cockeysville, Maryland? We don't know what the story means. 
So where do we see Jesus in the story? We see Jesus in the Samaritan for sure, the one who showed mercy, the one who showed compassion, the one who held nothing back but gave everything he had and more. We see Jesus there. But we see Jesus too in the man lying in the side of the road because we know that our Lord experienced rejection, beating, and even death for our sake. And we need to see ourselves in this story as well. We need to see ourselves, let's be honest, in the priest and the Levite who just walked by looking the other way. Because sometimes we do look the other way because it's too painful to look upon the hurts and the needs and the brokenness of others. Sometimes we need to see ourselves in the lawyer who says, I know what's right, Lord. Let me ask you if I'm doing the right thing. So Jesus will say, well done, good and faithful servant. And sometimes we too are like the one left bleeding and broken on the side of the road, praying that someone might see us and come to our aid. We're all over the story. So what does it be to mean to be a neighbor? Now, scripturally, in the beginning, it meant your kinsmen, those who were related to you, part of your tribe. But it was expanding, and it was expanding through the law. And you've got to remember that this lawyer absolutely knew the law, or he would never have approached Jesus saying, am I doing the right thing? So Jesus would say, add a boy. Now, neighbor expanded to mean the alien and the sojourner, the wanderer in the land, the alien who came through the land was to be treated as your kinsman, as your neighbor. And we're fond of saying love your neighbor, right? How many of you have ever, ever said love your neighbor? It's a lot easier to say love your neighbor than love the guy next door who lets his dog use your lawn as his toilet. <laughs> I am trying to sell a house in a small neighborhood in West Virginia. There were people from the volunteers and mission team at Harmony United Methodist Church who came out I had a florist in that congregation, and she oversaw this group of people trimming my shrubs and my hedges and everything else. A woman came running up the street and said, is the preacher dead? <laughs> Not poor preacher, but is her house for sale? Do you know who's selling her house? Because she wanted the house for her daughter. No, for her son. The woman across the street wanted the house for her daughter. And they started coming over to visit me to tell me how undeserving the other one was. Well, she says that's her husband, but that's her baby daddy. And I know you, pastor, don't want someone like that buying your house. And the other one said, well, he's just crazy. You don't need a crazy man living in your house. I'm thinking, I need a crazy man or someone with a baby daddy with $195,000 to live in my house. But that's a different story. Now, my homeowners association you would think goes by the Torah. That's what I call their covenants. How many laws, here's your Bible quiz for the day. Pastor Smiley, maybe you'll, no, you're, you're exempt. You don't have to answer this one. 400 and something laws, 432 laws, 613 laws and commandments together. That's how many laws this man had memorized in order to impress Jesus. There are about 658 laws in my homeowners association. One says you cannot park an RV on your property. Thus says the Lord your God. And the people across the street from me park their RV on their property behind their garage where if you really strained and leaned very far, you might be able to see the hitch but the woman across the street down the road who couldn't possibly see it unless she walked down there, walked around and looked at it, didn't like it there. And so she walked her dog on his property every day when it was time for the dog to do what dogs do. And they came out and said, please don't let your dog use our yarn as a toilet. To which she replied, as soon as you move your effing trailer, 
It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor, would you be mine? And you know, part of me is going to write in the description of my house, lovely neighborhood, lovely neighborhood. The trouble with using neighbor, it's one of those nice generic things. And I think the question that Jesus is asking us is the question we should be asking Jesus, not who is my neighbor, who's my Samaritan? That's a harder question, isn't it? I'm here to tell you, we all have a Samaritan. We all have a Samaritan. Sometimes, you know, there's a part of this story that is very ethnic, very racial in its makeup. Sometimes our Samaritan is someone who is different, who speaks a different language or has a different color or comes from a different place. But it's not always like that. Sometimes our Samaritan is someone who has hurt us so deeply we don't think we can ever, ever let it go. Sometimes our Samaritans belong to a group or a class of people that scare us. Maybe our Samaritans are people who are in gangs. Maybe our Samaritans are people who are addicted to drugs. Maybe our Samaritans are people who just are so unlike us that we don't know how in the world to be with them. But like I said, we all have Samaritans. I think it's okay to ask Jesus, who is my Samaritan? Because when you have the courage to ask that, he will tell you a story about your own life. He'll remind you that once you were a stranger, once you were the one who was hurting, once you were the one who was broken, once you were the one who was disappointed, once you were the one who was left alone on the side of the road. And he will give you the strength to turn your Samaritan into your neighbor and your neighbor into your friend and your friend into your family because you will see the image of God in that person, and I hope even in yourself, because all of us are created in the image of a loving, giving, forgiving, redeeming, restoring, resurrected Lord. And with that kind of power, there's nothing we can't do. I love me some Mr. Rogers. Do you know what his real job was? He was an ordained Presbyterian pastor. Some people think that Mr. Rogers was an ordained Presbyterian pastor who became a television star. No, he was ordained and his appointment, not that Presbyterians appoint, his call was as a televangelist because he felt the need to bring God into children's lives, not by name, he wasn't allowed to do that, but by every act of kindness and compassion and neighborliness that he could muster. Who couldn't love Mr. Rogers? Well, a lot of people. His funeral was protested by the Westboro Baptist Church. Someone stood across the street from the Presbyterian Church where his life was being celebrated holding a sign that said, God hates Mr. Rogers not because of anything he was. And you'll hear all sorts of things about Mr. Rogers really was this and that and the other. No, he was a kind, loving man who brought Jesus into people's lives as best he was able through his teaching and through his commitment to children in this country. He's also been blamed by certain media outlets and others for being the cause of millennials all being bad, bad people. I don't think millennials are bad people at all. They get a bad rap. It's hard to be young in today's world. It's very hard to be young in today's world. But there are critics of Mr. Rogers who said, because he told people that they can be loved as they are, he ruined a generation of America. I still want to live in his neighborhood because Mr. Rogers was only saying what he learned from his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God loves you as you are. 
in all your pain and your shame and your brokenness, in your sin, in your mistakes. God loves you, and God has sent his son to bring you back home. That's a good neighborhood to live in. So I hope that you'll have the courage. I have to do it myself because, you know, pastors were not born on a planet of pastors. And we don't live on a planet of pastors. We live in a really real world where there are people who just annoy me sometimes. I'm not always inclined to love everybody I meet. And if we wait until we have this natural affection, we're never going to love anyone. But if we realize that agape, the love of God in Jesus Christ, is an act of will that is informed and fueled by our faith, we will find that we love all kind of people. And we will find that other people come to love us because we will truly be the family that God created us to be. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you be? Won't you be? Please, won't you be my neighbor? you stand and join in singing.